Hi, everyone. Amanda Layden from the Vino Karma Project. Today, my special guest is Dr. Nicholas Harvey, who will be talking to us about the definition of code switching, why diversity is just jelly beans in a jar, and the four yeses. In order to learn more, you're going to have to listen and watch this episode. And if you like this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe below and share it to your friends and your colleagues. Hi, Nicholas, it's great to see you. So let's just dig in and start talking about where we are right now in the world. We are in a really important time as it relates to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Can you give us just, you know, an overview of the current landscape? Sure, sure. Um, as you and your, your, your viewers and listeners know, we understand this type of social justice reckoning that we've been experiencing really uh, since May of 2020. Coming out of that, there's been a a call to respond. Um, I would say that we're currently in a tension between promise, meaning sort of the the aspirational aspects where we're saying, you know what, things can get better. Uh, We need to address it. Um, There was this fierce urgency of now, but then there's the progress. And we're in the midst of attention right now. And I can speak more to that uh, because there's actually been some research talking about and really charting, you know, where are we between promise and progress? So where are we? (laughs) You know, you know, first of all, I think it depends upon with whom you're speaking, right? Because there are some places that have, have made measurable transformative change. But then there are those who are going through the, what I would describe as sort of checking off the boxes because essentially what the pandemic has done, it did not cause, but it really exposed and exacerbated and accelerated a a lot of what it is that we're seeing right now. And then amongst uh, certain communities, they're saying it's not enough. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's not enough. And my concern is that organizations are really not sensitive in terms of what box they'll find themselves and also the perceptions of their stakeholders, which I think is really important because as you and I um, have said, and so I'm gonna go ahead and say it on your show, (laughs) hypocrisy is a liability on the balance sheet. And so organizations are really going to have to be aware of that and take some intentional action to to be in conversation with their stakeholders and say, how do you perceive us? And that's really, really difficult because to, to, to find out that the emperor indeed has no clothes and it's sort of like, we knew this, right? Um, and then there are the groups that are just stuck and stymied. And those are places and spaces where I hope to be of service to people for those who just need to say, well, well, what can I do and help people in terms of their steps so they can ultimately begin to gain some momentum and bring about what I would describe as the sustainable change. Mm. I just want to reiterate that statement. Hypocrisy is a liability on the balance sheet. I mean, I think if we break that down, what you're really saying is that There is no excuse um, in this day and age. We can all take responsibility and recognize where each of us are on an individual level with our own journey, uh, with our own personal view of diversity, equity, and inclusion with how we show up. Um, But really organizations and their leadership need to start to step into further what that means so that they um, don't get caught out, so to speak. Can you give us an example of where you've seen this play out, you don't have to name a company uh, or an individual, but where you've seen this play out in today's current environment. Sure, sure. So I'm aware of a particular organization, um, a large company here in the US that uh, basically received a judgment in a class action lawsuit from the African-American managers in their organization for tens of millions of dollars. And this is an organization that is predominantly white. And so they're saying, well, what is it that we do now? You know, they've currently gone through naming an interim 
uh, person for diversity, equity, inclusion. They now have named a permanent person in the slot. And so I hope to be in conversation with them to, to help them avoid uh, just the errors, the, the idea of sort of going through the motions to, to move away from, from activities to outcomes. Mm. We're good on what I, what I call uh, sort of the DEI playbook, right? So if there's something going on in your corporation, your company, your group, your firm, well, we need employee resource groups. It's like, okay, great, but to what end? Mm -hmm. And how are you using them? And how are you using them properly, all right? Because you can get some really good insights into what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis, but then becomes the matter of what type of leadership and political will are you going to garner to make it happen? See, I don't believe that DEI is like a product rollout. I also don't believe that it's just a compliance issue. And so I, uh, my final piece is, I believe that it is misplaced if a CEO tries to just pass the baton off to someone else. Mm. It needs to be a CEO-led enterprise. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think in some of our conversations, you know, we've talked about D DEI is no longer a nice to have if an organization wants to have longevity and continue in this current landscape can you talk a little bit more about those outcomes that you would like to see sure so so first allow me to back it up a little bit <laughs> one of the things that i always say is do i really have to make the business case for dei <laughs> yeah so so how about we we do what's right when it's right because it is right. It's the idea that the work around diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, and justice is a moral imperative. So allow me to say that. So then what does it re really begin to look like in practice? And so the question is, um, I don't think that, that leaders are understanding what it really costs their employees to show up as their authentic selves, and so many have chosen not to, and they engage in uh, conforming behaviors, code switching. Mm -hmm. And so it's not really a safe place. And so also we understand that right now we're in the great resignation. And companies don't understand the degree to which, especially Gen Z, which is soon to be 28% of the workforce. So more than a quarter of the workforce are people born between 1997 and 2009. So it's sort of like, okay, what then does that mean for us? Well, their values are, are not what we call traditional. Mm -hmm. They're more inclusive, they're more accepting, and they'll make you pay not only in terms of the workforce, but also in the marketplace, because more and more consumers are looking for companies that reflect their values. So formally, we were in this place where we talk about corporate social responsibility, right? Where our corporations are trying to be sort of good citizens, you know, in the ecosystems in which they operate. Now it's about corporate social justice. And the uh, consumers, um, potential employees are looking for signals in the marketplace. So it's just beyond the HR issues. So when we talk about supplier diversity, when we talk about, you know, the environmental impact, right? We ask the questions about the products and services that are being, that are being supplied. But then how about the governance issues? Mm. What about the boards of directors? What is it that they're looking like? And then we're able to go ahead and talk about the measures and the metrics and being transparent about it, as opposed to just making statements and giving platitudes and saying the right thing but when we come inside the organizations, it's really costing employees to even show up every day. And right now they're making a decision to say, you know what, maybe I just won't. Mm. I think it's really important for leaders to be hearing this. And one thing you mentioned um, that stuck out to me that I've been thinking a lot about with the great resignation and with people making decisions is, is code switching. 
And so I might just have you define it really quick for people who may be watching this and, and don't know the terminolo terminology. It would be great if you could just share with people what that means. Sure, sure. Um, and so let me go ahead and, and introduce another piece while I'm at it, which is respectability politics. <laughs> you know, that there are certain norms of professionalism and we understand where they come from. They come from dominant culture. If you're not a part of that dominant culture, then one must adapt or switch in order to reflect those norms. And so it's a matter of, and, it, and on the flip side, it then starts speaking to certain um, microaggressions. So several years ago, and it still happens now, where you find a, a person who looks like me and people will say, oh, you, you speak so well. It's like, well, what is your, what is your expectation? Right. Um, so that continues to, to go on. And so there is maybe an, an assumption that I can't really be myself, that I have to be very, very careful about um, speaking in maybe a particular given dialect. All right. That I cannot do that at work mm -hmm. or I cannot talk about what my partner and I did over the weekend. All right. Mm -hmm. Because the norms of that company speak to, you know, oh, well, we, we're, we're uncomfortable with that. You know, we can't talk about uh, certain, certain cultural issues, um, race, gender, orientation, non-binary, <laughs> and the list goes on because of the established norms in an organization. You know, I think about that one too with um, appearance, you know, with hair, natural hair versus, mm -hmm you know, treated hair, for example, and the expectation, even I was listening to something recently, I think it was on NPR and um, a black woman was talking about her decision to perhaps not go back into the office right now because of, um, you know, being able to be at home during the pandemic and feeling like she had a barrier and a buffer between her and her um, mostly white colleagues. Uh, and now having to come back into not presenting as her whole self in the office, what toll do you think those kinds of decisions are, are going to have on organizations now, as well as individuals? People are making the choice that they, they won't put up with it anymore. The, the pandemic has already cost us enough. Mm -hmm. you know, we, we, so in, in, I did an insights piece. And we're saying, you know, what's going on as we talk about, you know, politics, pandemics, um, policy, what's going on, what then become the effects for leaders in the midst of doing their work. So, of course, you sort of have the, the, the usual suspects, but the piece that I, keep, I, that I keep seeing and is still happening now, equity and equilibrium. Mm -hmm. Equity meaning the topics that we're talking about right now, but equilibrium is mental health. Mm -hmm. And people are saying, you know what? I have just been through, you know, in, in, in our family, we make up other P words based upon how you're feeling in the day about the pandemic. So we don't necessarily say pandemic. I might say panoramic, <laughs> right? Or sometimes it comes in and, 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 and hits you in the head. So I've been through the perpendicular <laughs> or you're, you're hot and pressed and it's hard and you're going through a panini, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. These are descriptions of deleterious mental health effects. Mm -hmm. And so the adverse mental health effects that people have experienced as a result of the pandemic, I'm not gonna use the word result and because that would be a misnomer. Again, the pandemic amplified, exposed and accelerated what it is that people are experiencing. And folks are saying, you know what? I will figure it out. I will make a way and people are resigning People are starting their own businesses. So there are those opportunities that are going on and you have to be aware of it. And for organizations, you're, you're losing your best talent. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't do it, guess what? Your competitor is figuring it out and will beat you in the marketplace. That's so true. Can you specifically talk about the work that your company does and the impact you're making in this space uh, in organizations? Sure, sure. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. 
So if anybody were to say, so what is it you do? <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, we're creating ready now leaders for a changing workforce. And so it's the idea of that because the workforce is changing, that leaders must also be adaptable and up-level their own skills. Mm -hmm. And really it's in the place of the human skills. So we, we, we have the technical skills, we have the strategic skills, but the idea of seeing each other as human beings, recognizing that we are, we are leading and managing and working with and collaborating with other human beings and not just interchangeable cogs in the wheel. We first started seeing those conversations really with Robert Greenleaf and this idea of servant leadership. But I think that one of the shortcomings of, of that is that uh, sometimes depending upon which sector you might find yourself, People might say, well, you know, I'm, 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 I'm serving those that I'm leading. Well, I believe that we serve through leading because at the end of the day, we still need to lead. Mm -hmm. But it's the way that we lead. Where's the empathy? Where's the compassion? Where's the fact that we're dealing with another human being? And this idea that we have, we have othered <laughs> our fellow human beings has really become difficult and a barrier. And so how is it that we're able to overcome that? Reduce the resistance, have appropriate conversations. And again, as I've said, to up-level the skills of leaders. And so that happens in two places. One is just by talking about inclusive leadership, what that means, what that looks like, how you go about putting that into practice. And then the idea of saying, um, what type of awareness and management do we really need to put it into practice and to make it happen? Hmm. So during this time of, uh, I guess, collective reckoning, I'm not sure if all of us are there, um, you know, people, I think, um, have been, okay, I'll just put myself into this category. Some white people have been reluctant to have conversations with their black and brown colleagues, people of color, and really approach um, with an open mind conversations about race and injustice. You know, how do you feel that perhaps white managers, white colleagues um, should approach these conversations uh, with their black and brown colleagues? Um, I think the first one, the first word is going to be humility. And um, if, if I can put it, just sort of put it out there for, for just anybody, right? So this goes for business owners, managers, whomever. The idea of you need to make a friend before you meet a need. And so often uh, we're trying to sort of close the deal. Mm. And I think that we see um, our work and conversations around DEI like closing a deal. Mm -hmm. We're actually, no we're going to make a friend. <laughs> we're going to be in relationship with people. And so for a manager and leader, we come from a place of humility and say, this is what's going on. This is what I'm trying to do. So I'm going to be transparent about my own weaknesses, flaws, shortcomings. And essentially I will, I will let those with whom I serve, I'll let them know I am human. I don't know everything. I'm coming to talk to you about it, not in the place of, I need you to help me. S stop it. Mm. I, I had the opportunity to share with the um, Association for Latino Professionals for America. And I, and I made this statement. So another one of those, <laughs> those statements <laughs> for your audience is that people of color have been carrying white people's emotional water for too long. Mm -hmm. So let's not make people of color responsible for the way whites think about it, feel about it, <laughs> and the solutions that they're looking for. It's like, no, no, you're, you get to do your own work, all right? Which I think is very, very important. And so when managers come from, from that perspective, so um, one, of our, one, of our, one of our peers and, and colleagues, um, just a conversation was raised about, can, can black women save companies? It's like, oh, so, oh, so, so, oh, so now you're, you're, you're looking for women of color. It's like, what? It's, not their, it's not their responsibility to save your company, mm -hmm. right? 
this is really about equity in the workplace. It's about equity in other relationships. It's about equity in the world. So I would, I would offer to you and to your viewers and listeners to just Google Zora Neale Hurston and see what she has to say about the Black woman as the mules. Mm, very, very powerful. And I appreciate your perspective on that. And also, you know, pushing the responsibility back on, on people where they need to take the onus. I think it's great for all of us to want to be educated and to learn and to better ourselves. But as you say, it, it the burden, you shouldn't be carrying our water anymore. <laughs> um, so um, this is going to be a, a loaded question. Um, what do you wish would happen now in this moment in time that could help us to, um, I guess, you know, become more unified and see humanity in one another? I believe that one of the most powerful pieces or elements that we have as human beings is the power of choice. And so for me, as a, as a coach, as a consultant, I just ask people, is this the outcome you really want? Mm. So fun story. So you know my background and how I pastored and people would come to me for, for, for marriage counseling, which was, which was usually pre-divorce counseling, but <laughs> <laughs> we'll call it marital counseling. <laughs> and so before I would talk to anybody, I need four yeses. So any couple coming to see me, I need four yeses. Okay. So from each person, I would say, do you want to be married to each other? I need yes and a yes. If I end up with one yes and a, eh, I don't know. It's like, get out of my office because you're not serious. Okay. But if I get two yeses, then I need two more yeses from each party. Are you willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done? Again, I need two yeses. If I get a, oh yes, and it's like, mm, I don't know, get out of my office, <laughs> all right? Mm -hmm. So you ask me, what is it that I would, would wish is for folks to be honest and be serious? Mm. Because I, I, I understand, and in my work, you know, and part of my models in, in terms of people's growth through this process, um, there, there are different levels. And so if you wanna say, you know what? I don't really want to be, you know, an embracer of all humanity and all that. It's like, okay, well, but, but where, where, where do you want to be? Where do you feel you need to be? And we can help people grow to that. And it's not going to be overnight, but at least be honest. Mm -hmm. let, let's not, let's not play games with our stakeholders mm -hmm. because people have played games long enough. It's the idea that through the constitution of the United States, wrote to this nation and provided a promissory note. And now it's time to pay up. Mm. Because when it said that all, notice the language, men were created equal and endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights among them, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. It did not include people that look like me mm -hmm. or even women mm -hmm. or the indigenous or anything like mm -hmm. that. But we're now saying, you know what? It really should. And so here's an opportunity for us as a country to fulfill that aspirational vision. Mm. Nicholas, that, you know, you saying that is, you know, I want people to stop and really think on that because that's, that's not a we're in or we're out, you know, it's not like we're dipping the toe in the proverbial water. This is, you know, it's time for all of humanity to take a stand. Yes. Yes, I, I really believe um, that, that life will make a liar out of you. Mm -hmm. Life will let will, will show on broad display what it is you really believe. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I was pastoring a congregation, um, happened to be a predominantly white congregation. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? You all are great with people of color until your daughter brings me home. Now we'll know how you really feel, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what, what is it that you really mean saying, oh, you know, we want, you know, people of color in our church. Really? Is it just because they have resources 
and they can work and so on and so forth, but will you allow them into the power structures? Oh, now we're talking about equity. Yeah. Diversity is just jelly beans in the jar. Ooh, isn't this pretty? Mm -hmm. But when we start talking about power sharing, start moving from power over to power with, that's another conversation. It's a completely different conversation. And it makes me think about what's going on in places like Texas, for example, where really the the people that are making the laws right now are really truly, if you if you look at the demographics of Texas, the amount of people of color, the amount of the LGBTQIA community, um, people who have, you know, the, the blue wave is not just in Austin, it's in other places in Texas. And you have this small minority who's hanging on to the uh, yesteryears of what they think the constitution was created on and what they think. No, it's, I don't even know if it's what they think their, their constituents want. I think it's what they want because they're so f- afraid to share the power structures and to really give way to what this country truly looks like. Sure. Now, in all fairness, <laughs> whatever party's in power will do the gerrymandering. So you know that we're redrawing our, our congressional lines right now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I think that what is, is, is most telling is when Representative Sheila Jackson Lee could potentially lose her seat because of the redrawn lines, African-American female congresswoman, mm-hmm. and to say, okay, friends, okay, we, 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 un- we understand what happens once again when different parties are in power. Sure, they're going to go ahead and draw the lines. But I think that what the real problem is is that there are no longer just sort of the, the understood policies and procedures because we remember how um, the Supreme Court, you know, we, we refer to it as Shelby the Holder, where there are the preclearance um, options or preclearance requirements for laws amongst the states. We no longer have that amongst our mm-hmm. southern states, which then has brought this, this, this influx of laws where people will do a test. And so what happens, as, as I say, um, as goes in Texas, so goes Georgia. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I, I, well, I feel like we could carry on this conversation for quite some time because it's, I mean, this is a whole different conversation around what has to change in our country in order to preserve democracy and really uh, mm-hmm. what the people, the people of this country want, particularly the changing face, as you were mentioning, you know, Gen Z coming up in America, which values different values than our my forefathers certainly and you know our i think people who built this originally built this country um however i'm going to take it back to you know what do you feel is the responsibility of leaders and companies to publicly state their position when it comes to race injustice pandemics fill in the blank of other issues that happen in society Sure, sure. Again, the movement from corporate social responsibility to corporate social justice, I believe they should. But I would rather that if they're not serious about it, don't say anything. Mm. Right. Well, we, we've well, certainly seen a lot of that over the past year and a half. Right. You know, why raise up those, um, those expectations? You know, why is it? Why, let me go ahead and to be just really bold and say, why, why are we lying to people? Mm where mm-hmm. you're just saying, oh yes, we support this and we support that, really? Well, let's go ahead and look at the alignment mm-hmm. and let's look at the pertinent metrics and measures. So let's see your hiring stats. So what's been happening since you made this promise? Mm-hmm. Okay. My real piece is I wanna look at the board. We, we have to look at these governance structures mm-hmm. because alignment has to be from top to bottom. And the sad piece about it, Amanda, is that folks can get help if they really want to. No, there are so many of us that are Mm -hmm. out here doing this work. Mm -hmm. Um, The difference that I bring to it is that I come to it from the place of leadership. I believe that it's about your leadership skills. It's about your human skills that you're now required to bring to bear, to bring about the change that we seek, to have a welcoming workplace, 
have psychological safety and places where people can bring their whole authentic selves to work. Mm. So yes, say something, but I think as people say, you know, if you can't say anything good, don't say anything at all. I'm like, if you can't to go ahead and speak the truth, just, just, just don't, <laughs> just don't. So if I'm a leader and I'm listening to this, how do I know when it's the right time to connect with you and your organization to help me on this DE&I journey? Sure. So first of all, now <laughs> you, 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 should have been, you should have been calling, but there are signals within your organization, like you're losing talent. All right. You're starting to, to, you know, to, to, to recognize that you're out of step with what's going on as you're looking towards the future. You know, let's have that conversation. What's going on with your supplier diversity? Just go ahead and look at it. OK, mm -hmm. so take a look at your metrics. That's something that you can do internally. Right. And say, are we reflecting our highest and best selves around diversity, in, uh, equity, inclusion, belonging and justice? Have the conversation with with people again, honest conversations. One of the things that I've said is find 10 folks in your organization that you do not know. OK, not the inner circle people. Just go take a walk on the shop floor. Go and find folks you do not know and ask them, what does it cost you to be here? Hmm. The idea, and Jack Welch of GE talked about management by walking around. Mm -hmm. So let's get out of the C-suite, mm. <laughs> take a walk down to the street and see what's happening down there. And that's where you start beginning the conversations. One of the things that I used to do as a leader is I would just ask average people. So if you were me, what would you do? Again, that's a humble position, mm -hmm. right? Um, General Colin Powell, one of the things that, uh, that he used to do is he would have these conversations where he said he would take the rank off. So we would come out from behind the desk, the big desk, and go and sit to the side somewhere. So that means whether you're, you know, you know he's, he's, a, he's a flag officer, you're a butter bar, second lieutenant, we take the rank off. And when we take the rank off, then you change the power dynamic and you'll be surprised what people will tell you if you just ask. Mm -hmm. That, I mean, if, if leaders aren't doing that right now, then that's really doing their people a disservice. But it's such a good way you paint that picture to get people into the idea of how easy it is just to, again, showcase your humanity and listen to what's happening on your proverbial shop floor, whatever that may be. So Nicholas, I have a couple more questions for, for you. I was hoping you'd be willing to share about inclusionetics. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, so I describe that as the art and science of inclusive leadership. And the, the reason why I, I, I coin it that way is because we all have an inclination towards inclusion. And so that goes back to the being honest with where you are. So, you know, have the ability to, to, to go ahead and measure where you are now. So that we then talk about where is it that you want to go and to be honest about it. If you're trying to go somewhere, you need to first establish where you are, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And then talk about what is it that that will look like, all right? And what works for you, what works for you in your organization. And that becomes just a, a, a wonderful place because you know what? When people know who you are and what is it you're about, then it, they, they have more power uh, and control in terms of their work because then they can choose. They don't just have to go off their gut. This idea of saying, you know what? I think I'm experiencing this, but I really don't know. See, part of the experience of, of, of people of color and others has been the gaslighting. Mm -hmm. They're saying, no, 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 they didn't, they didn't mean it that way. Or, or, or is it me? Mm -hmm. And what then happens where you have this revelation that, you know what, it's not me. <laughs> this is actually happening to me and has been happening to me. And I've been really sort of putting up with it. And so now people really have the power of choice that's available to them. Mm -hmm. So what Inclusion Eggs then does is it really goes back to us in terms of our origins and how we are hardwired as humans to basically shun difference. 
when we have that level of awareness, then we're able to begin to say, all right, how then do I manage that? How do I um, engage in a sort of a higher level of self-command for myself? So there's I'm engage, engaging with somebody who's not different. They're just not me. Mm-hmm. And think about how many people are just not you, right? Everybody else. <laughs> Everybody else. <laughs> yes. yes. So it really helps because how do we work in our, in our relationships one with another? That's so important. You know, Rodney, Rodney King was asking that question years ago. Can't we all just get along? Mm-hmm. I'm like, not yet. We've got some work to do. Mm-hmm. And so we should say that inclusion ethics is proprietary to you and your organization. Yes. Yes. And so for folks who are listening to this and want to learn more, they should certainly reach out to you to learn how inclusion ethics is, is the new wave of DEI and the, and the new way to think about it and to help bring everybody along um, for equity and equilibrium. Yes. Yes. So one more question before I let you get back to the busy work of changing the world. Um, what gives you hope right now? Mm. The generations that are coming behind us, they're the serious ones. Mm. So I was had the opportunity uh, to talk about this, this sort of this model, this idea of, so, so for the first 30 years of your life, you learn, the next 30 years of your life you earn, and then the next 30 years of your life you leave your legacy. And so I've had the privilege of um, working with folks uh, who have sort of made me a part of their legacy. You know, um, I'm from Atlanta. And so when we start talking about our civil rights leaders and icons and those who have passed and gone on, I knew them growing up. That, that was, that's all I've known mm-hmm. my entire life. And so I think the, the young people um, are doing um, a fine job. What gives me hope and part of my work is making sure that they understand the successful lessons of the past. Because one of the challenges has been this passing of the baton where folks have just held on to the baton and don't want to let go and let it pass on. You know, th- this idea of, gee, you know what? I, I wish I knew now at X age, you know, what so many years ago, pass it on to the younger generation. Mm-hmm. Teach them about what was it that made, you know, the civil rights movement successful. Rosa Parks did not just get tired. <laughs> this was a strategy. Mm-hmm. I, on, on, on another show, I did the, the opportunity. Well, I had my own piece called Policy for Liberation. And I invited my old history professor to come and she and I had a conversation and I asked about the strategy that there was a judicial strategy which that then connected to the legislative strategy which is about policy change. And so now I'm linking policy change and social change. Mm. Those conversations are happening now more so than ever. I, I so celebrated um, uh, your, your friend, Dr. Ibram X. Kendi, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. When he starts talking about racist policy, mm. we have to speak to the policies. We spend so much of our time trying to point our fingers at people calling you, well, this person is racist or this person is racist. It's like, we need to deal with racist policy. So we've got young people, we're having the conversation in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that is at least new to this generation. They were having in the 50s. Somehow we lost it. And so that's coming back. And so I'm really excited about that. Um, and then I'm also hopeful and excited for, for people like yourself, right? That there are folks that are out there who are saying, you know what? The change that we seek will not come about if we just put it on the other community. And I can no longer sit idly by on the sidelines. I cannot be an accommodationist. I can't be one that asks people to assimilate to be like me. No more will incrementalism do. I'm gonna have to get into this 
and I'm going to have to challenge people in my own community. And so I'm grateful, you know, for what it is that you're doing in your work. You know, the idea that you um, speak to organizations that they need to be social enterprises right now, mm -hmm. not just looking for the interest of shareholders, but stakeholders. Mm -hmm. We're in an ecosystem and we're all in this together. Mm, beautifully said. Um, thank you so much for that. And I really um, honor you and your work. And I cannot wait to see what the next you know, couple years hold for you. And I hope I can, you just remember me when <laughs> the world wakes up to Dr. Dr. Nicholas Harvey out of Atlanta. Um, <laughs> um, it has been a pleasure chatting with you today. Uh, I really hope that people listening to this and watching this have learned something and also shifted their perspective. And as we say here at Vino Karma, continue to go out there and create change in the world one sip at a time. Cheers. Cheers.